Do you want to maximize your success with NCUA? Join Mark Trifle as he shares with you the insider's view on passing your exam with Flying Colors. The With Flying Colors podcast is sponsored by Credit Union Exam Solutions by Mark Trichel. If you would like to work directly with the Credit Union Exam Solutions team and receive support to optimize your results with NCUA so you save time and money, visit us at marktrichel.com to find out more. Hey everyone, this is Mark Treichel with another episode of With Flying Colors. This is part two of me chatting with Steve Farr and Todd Miller of my team. Last week, we tackled half of the priority letter. This week, we tackle the other half, which includes Consumer Financial Protection, Bank Secrecy Act, Cybersecurity, Support for Small Credit Unions and Minority Depository Institutions. And stick around to the end where we talk about the timeliness or lack thereof of examination reports, an issue that Vice Chairman Kyle Hauptman of the NCUA board talked about at the January board meeting. We have some thoughts relative to that and the thoughts on the importance of communication uh, during the exam process. All right, here we go. Uh, First up will be consumer financial protection and part two of NCUA's supervisory priority letter. Next up on NCUA's list is consumer financial protection number three, which was number six in 2023 and number seven in 2022. So it keeps moving up uh, on the priority list. Uh, Consumer financial protection, what are your thoughts relative to what NCUA has said here in its supervisory priority plan? I think you can look at NCUA's budget and see right there what the priority on that is because the resources that are going to be put into that. Let's see, the proposed 2024 budget includes 13 additional regional consumer compliance specialists and an increase in examination time for consumer financial protection. Uh, review equivalent to 11 examiners to increase the agency's review of financial protection and fair lending laws, regulations, especially at institutions with greater consumer impact or indications of potential violation. So it's really upfront. Resources are going to be put into there. Now, as you as credit unions, those types of exams start taking up your resources, but you need to make sure that your saw is sharpened on that because they, it's even starting at the top and that the administration is seeking to tap what they call tamp down junk fees. And that's why they've come out with a, a kind of a proposal to do something about NSF fees against the really large institutions. So that focus starts very high and is shared by the NCUA board. Very well said. Very well said. Todd, your thoughts on it? They've told us for a couple of years that this is the direction we're going. The jump fees were mentioned very early on in the Biden administration. Was it the year before last where NCUA was starting to gather up survey data on what people were doing with their overdraft programs? That kind of tells you they were looking at doing something along the lines of this. When they say, okay, we're going to start gathering up survey data on it. They've never really said what they did with that survey data they gathered, but I think we're starting to see that here there's going to be a focus on those overdraft programs. I don't necessarily see this as a bad thing. It's probably a good thing, some of this consumer protection stuff. The credit and political organizations, they can fight with NCUA about how large that budget becomes because it is the credit union's money. And at the end of the day, the more credit unions do to make sure they're handling things properly, the greater chance you have will NCUA dialing that budget back. So it's back to doing the right thing and paying attention to your own. And we've seen it in clients where they're finding things, especially with indirect loan programs or that third-party vendors getting an APR wrong or something. And and so they're looking at that, especially these third-party relationships where you have a third party that's filling out all these disclosures for you. Credit unions really pay attention to that and make sure you have good quality control on that because we definitely see examiners looking at that whole fair lending and disclosure piece with third parties, especially. We've seen it in the last year. And so this is just a continuation of that. Yeah. 
Very, very much so. And I'll be doing a separate podcast with Joe Goldberg, Consumer Financial Protection, another one of our team members. And I've got another, another company that does some of this that I'm going to be doing a podcast on uh, soon. But yeah, the budget, when you put money on something, you can see the numbers go up. That is a telltale sign. And it's been very clear in Chairman Harper's statements that this is the direction he wants to go. He even said, in the January board meeting, which I referenced in a, a previous podcast that he wants to put consumer protection on equal footing with safety and soundness. Now, that's, that's an attention-grabbing statement, equal footing. If the budget was equal, uh, there'd be rioting in the streets because the, the amount of the budget would essentially almost have to double because NCOA's focus on that and money spent on that when you do 24 fair landing exams and then you want to increase it to 30 and then you want to increase it to 60 and you compare that to the thousands of, of safety and soundness type exams they do, equal footing is a lofty goal, but it also puts it up in the bright lights. He's making a, sta- a political statement when he makes that statement that, hey, this isn't going away while I'm chairman. We're going to keep putting more into it. And when you look at what they put into the budget when... It was two Republicans that voted on the budget with one Democrat. And since that point in time, Rodney Wood has gone and Tanya Otska has joined. And at her first board meeting, she talks about redlining and the issues that are out there. And they, they didn't mention Navy Federal Credit Union, but they alluded to Navy Federal Credit Union because Navy had a very bad story in CNN, which triggered the banking committees, both sides, the Dems and the Republicans, to write to CFPB saying, hey, we want you to look at this. And oh, by the way, Tanya Otska came from Sherrod Brown's staff at the banking committee and was there when all that was going on. And in her first public statement, she says, I'm going to be watching consumer compliance and it's going to be one of my priorities. And then link it back, like you guys said, it's the Biden administration appointed by Biden, tied to the banking committee. Uh, Dot your I's, cross your T's, spend a little bit more money on this credit union because the emphasis will go up. So 2025, I guess where I was going, 2025 budget, will be the first one with two Democrats in charge in 10 years. And you could expect to see more growth in that arena based on what they find this year. All right, so we've hit credit risk, liquidity risk, consumer financial protection, and interest rate risk. Number four on the list, and this is always present, is information security or cybersecurity risk which was number five in 2023. And it was number two, it rose all the way to number two in 2022. So here we sit with it in fourth place, but this is one of those I call perpetual. There's occasional priorities like fraud, there's, and there's perpetual uh, priorities like cybersecurity. And I know both of you had backgrounds in this way back, uh, but it's not, your, it's not your niche right now, but what are your thoughts relative to cybersecurity and security guys? Once again, you can look at the comments in the bu- in, from the budget comments, and they pointed out that NSU has 30 regional information security specialists for exams and supervision. So the resources are there for NCOA to me, me, even be helpful in this process, which is what we really hope for, hope for there, and that they will become a resource to you as uh, problems are, come up. But it's definitely an operational risk. Geopolitical events continue to increase the likelihood of cyber attacks. The industry's software infrastructure remains somewhat vulnerable to cyber attacks, including ransomware attacks and threats from third-party service providers. So the risk is real. The expense of fixing something when it goes wrong is, is very real and can have material impact. And it seems like from this, the recent stuff in there that This requirement for these timely notifications and identification and notifying is a big uh, part of this letter. The notification is interesting because we just had a client, you know, they got wrote up for not notifying the agency of an ATM skimming event because ATM NCUA determined that was an event where members' information was stolen. So while I haven't went back and read the reg, Obviously, they're putting a very broad interpretation on events that require notification. So okay. I might dig into that. It could almost become a full-time job for um, a large credit union. The other thing that out there is the whole artificial intelligence. And while well, that could become a very powerful tool for credit unions to save expenses in the future, 
It's also wide open three barn doors for something that could create opportunities for fraud and fishing tax. Everything else, Mark's little temporary podcast where he used AI to create it with his own voice to just tell you how vulnerable institutions are to that technology in the future. It's going to be pretty significant. Yeah. And Todd, you're referring to a short podcast I did. And this is not Mark Trackle. This voice is created by AI. And uh, it sounds like me, a little bit more monotone than normal, but uh, it sounds like me. And you, you guys and my wife could tell that it's not me. But if you're hearing me for the first time or you haven't heard me in a while, I uh, use kind of sounds like Mark and there are other AI tools out there that, that are, it's only going to get harder and harder in that arena. And this, the costs associated with this for credit is the consumer compliance costs going, you've got costs in this that you got to like, dot your eyes and press your teeth. And oh, by the way, the feds painted you into a corner based on your balance sheet and, and your NEVs hurt a little bit, but we're not going to count your income. We're, we're not going to let you consider income simulation. It's a challenging time right now to be a CEO, to be a board member, to be a credit union. Todd, as you said, they're weathering the storm real well, which says an awful lot. Well, guys, let's see. Next up, Bank Secrecy Act. Anything relative to that? Again, this is a perpetual. It's there. It's the safety of the country. It's terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. But any thoughts on Bank Secrecy Act here on the priority letter? It's always going to be there. And we mentioned AI and some of these new frauds. They just create your whole challenge for bank secrecy. The app, it just got bigger. I, I have not really paid attention to what kind of numbers of SAR reports get filed with FinCEN or even an individual credit union. But this almost has to be growing. And you see some of the fraud and suspicious activity stuff. That always goes up when people have less money and are challenged and they're being challenged right now. And once again, we have a fact where inflation is faster than income growth for certain segments of society, it's creating problems for them. And that creates more incidences of fraud for our credit unions. So, and just another sideline of all the other stuff that's going on with liquidity and interest rate risk that puts more pressure on fraudulent activity too. The BSA stuff just has to get better and better. And the challenges for credit unions is they all use software to manage this and the false positives. It just takes a lot of time and money to keep up with this. It's not fun stuff, but it's hugely important and requires a lot of resources of our institutions. And like you said, it's on here every year, and I think it will continue to be on here every year. Or going away. That's right. The examiners are going to continue to look at it, and it seems like they dig into it a little bit deeper all the time. Yeah, and, and once again, the budget points out resources going in there. Uh, proposed 2024 budget supports the second phase in this effort on BSA by adding 27 new regional examination staff, including specialists and supervisory positions. Uh, these special, uh, so the resources are going in there. Some of the other comments I've, I've read from other regulators, they're concerned about how nested some of these third party that you end up working with can be, and then you end up actually responsible for something that's way down the line and a little bit difficult for you to identify, but you're still responsible for it. So that uh, certainly is, is always an issue. Suspicious activity report data trends reflected significant increase in SAR filings related to fraud. The numbers are, are up, but focus has been increased too. And like Todd says, uh, when you have people that are in, in need of the need is there for funds and there's no other way that they see to get it and the opportunity they think is there, they're going to try and take advantage of it. Yes. The part of the, the, the fraud triangle, right? The opportunity and the need. And I can't remember, I can't remember what the third leg in that stool is, but all great points. So last on the letter, support for small credit unions and minority depository institutions. I know that when we started back in the day, there were, were what, 15, 16,000 credit unions traveling. They're down to be about 4,800 now. So two thirds of those charters are gone. Most of them small. Any thoughts relative to uh, the reference here to small credit unions and minority depository institutions? 
CUA puts resources to it. I think they've got several events laid out. I read something the other day, the biggest piece of this, and it might've been something Todd Harper said, a lot of this is succession planning. These small credit unions, they have to find their own unique issues and it takes unique people to you position and to operate in those niches. And in the general economy, everything's getting more expensive. It's getting more challenging for small credit unions. Probably our definition of what a small credit union is needs to change. So you can get that asset level up higher as the director of special actions. And even when Steve and I were problem case officers, you spend a lot of time in these smaller credit unions trying to preserve them. Oftentimes you can't. And like I said, you get that key person that retires and leaves. And a lot of times the smaller credit unions tend to fall apart. It's always going to be continuous challenge. The industry points to these small credit unions as a reason for their tax exemption. It's just going to, all the challenges large credit unions face, the small credit unions face them squared. Yep. Times 10. Yep. Exactly. Steve, any thoughts? No, I think Todd summed it up for really well. Okay, very good. And Todd, you referenced succession planning, and there is a, a letter to credit unions out there. There was a proposed rule that came out early on in uh, Chairman Harper's reign as chair. Uh, didn't have a second vote for it because the other two Republicans felt it should be dealt with in a letter format. And now that he has a second vote, one of my other predictions is first half of 2024, there will that proposed rule will be made finalized on succession planning, but it really creates some principles that credit unions should probably already be doing and that are already out there in the letter. And by the way, it only applies to federal credit unions, but that's a prediction of, of a new regulatory burden that I think will be out there. But I think, well, I, I wouldn't regulate it. I think a letter is okay. They're going to formalize it into a regulation is my prediction relative to that. All right. Well, this has been a great, a great discussion on all these topics. Any final thoughts here on the letter or, or anything else before we, we wrap up this episode? I have one thing, and it's actually on some of Steve's notes, and this is told the timeliness of exam reports. And something I see that kind of bothered me a little bit is that we'll see a credit union, they'll have an effective date. They don't get an exam for six months, and then they get 30 days to correct a really large problem and it makes you wonder it's hard for boards to determine what's the real sense of urgency here. It takes you six months to talk to us about it, but then you want us to fix it in 30 days. There needs to be some, I, I can't speak to you inside of NCUA why all of a sudden it's taken five, six months to get exam reports issued to some of these credit unions, but we're seeing that. And some of the things that they're asking credit used to do are important. They, uh, it hurts the industry when you don't get it to them timely and get them working on it as well. Yeah, we're just seeing that amongst the people that hire us anyway. It just seems like it's taken longer and longer for them to get exam. It's almost where they're in and doing the starting a follow-up before they even get the first report. Very well said. And at the last incident board meeting at the annual performance plan, Kyle Houtman highlighted the fact that the exam survey, talk about the exam survey being blind and that they have a goal on achieving certain things. And part of that goal is that they're going to 90% of the time start and complete their exams on time. So what does that tell you? They, they needed to establish a goal to get to 90%, meaning they're somewhere less than 90%, either on starting or completing. And we've seen both, right? I think they're quite a ways from 90% if our sample is anything close to normal, because it's time after time. And actually, Kyle Hauptman said something, board member Hauptman said something to the effect that we are constantly being told by credit unions that you haven't given me my report and you're already coming back in. And that's just not right. And part of it may be the secondary review process, which was much needed. It was, it was the only agency that didn't have a higher level. Uh, and maybe with the pandemic, things getting completed took longer. But it's clear, it's, but it's, a, that's probably my favorite thing in the annual performance report, because as they all said, what gets measured gets done. 
and they're measuring it now and they're paying attention to it now. I think about back in the days when we were PCOs or directors of special actions, code four, code five, you had to have an exam within in 120 days and it had to be uploaded, period, period. No exceptions, period. Code three, six months. And then they, they stretched the exam process and they went from end date to end date to measuring it by start date to end date, which gave them some flexibility. And it's just got, in my opinion, muddled and it wasn't being measured and other things were happening and it stuck them a little bit by surprise. So I'm thrilled that they got it in there, but I just had a conversation before we recorded this. When got Ready Union just had their joint conference. When do you think we'll get, do you think we'll get a report uh, by X? And I said, well, you should, based on what I'm saying, you might want to add at least 30 and maybe 60 days to that. And, and like you said, Todd, and then, oh, by the way, we'll give it to you six months later. And we, but we, when we told you you needed to do it, it was two months ago. It took us so long. We'll give you till the middle of next month to get it done. That just shouldn't fly. I wonder if some of this is merit because the whole time I was a supervisor, there was always a monthly report on exams outstanding. You know, how many days it had been from when they start to when they finished. We always had a number to where you wanted to limit that time outstanding. That used to be part of the yeah. monthly report package supervisors got and RDs used to pay attention to it. They're paying attention to it. They're paying attention to it now, but you're right. Somewhere along the way, and as I've said in other podcasts, when you're having some priority, nothing's a priority. When you're trying to do everything, some of the back to basics, we talked about getting back to basic. Completion of an exam report is about as basic as you can get. I'm glad to see they're highlighting it. So, yeah, All right, gentlemen. Steve, go ahead. Out, it's always just one more thing. I mean, it always comes down to that communications. And and what you can control if you're a credit union is what you're doing. You can't necessarily control how the examiner's getting back to you, but if you're doing all the right efforts to make yourself available, to be engaged with the examiners, let them know your door is open and you might start having to document, here's the outreaches that we did and, no, and lack of responses. Do what you can control because you can't necessarily control what comes back from your examiner or NCUA, but... Make sure that your end is really well done. That's a great place to wrap, guys. As always, this is my favorite podcast of the year, and I appreciate uh, your time and your thoughtful comments as it relates to the letter. And listeners, I want to thank you for listening. This is Mark Trichel signing off with another episode of With Flying Colors. I hope you'll listen again soon. Thank you for joining us on this episode of With Flying Colors. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app to hear future episodes where subject matter experts of all varieties will provide tips on how to achieve success with NCUA. If you would like to learn more about how we assist credit unions, check out our services at marktrichel.com. 